I want to thank Bridgen for uh, not only putting this together, but for um, inviting me to participate. Um, this is a topic that is, uh, that is very dear to me, and it is something that uh, I've had to think about a lot over the years. I'm fortunate in that I get my own fellow uh, for a whole year to teach and train advanced endoscopy to, uh, but the trickle down to that is that you really think about how to break down doing an endoscopy um, and how to sort of impart that knowledge onto your trainees. So I've been fortunate to be able to sort of work with fellows at every level, um, uh, in including the ASGE's first year fellows course where you know, you, you really have fresh first-year fellows with, with animal models and you're teaching them the very, very basics of how to do endoscopy. So with that, um, my objectives tonight are to discuss tips on how to effectively teach diagnostic and therapeutic upper endoscopy to GI trainees. However, the goal of this talk is not to focus on how to do an EGD, but how to teach the fundamentals of performing endoscopy in order to help create a foundation for the fellow to build upon. So um, this is sort of the pathway to becoming a gastroenterologist and an endoscopist. We go through all these years of schooling, we go through all these years of training, residency, and we learn how to take care of patients, interact with patients, and then day one, a scope is put in your hand and you're told, do it. Um, and oftentimes this is what ends up happening. It's really a completely new skill. It's a completely new area that we're not used to. I mean, we're just not used to. So how do we impart this knowledge onto our fellows? So the things I'm gonna focus on are uh, discussing scoping, the scopes and equipment, how to maneuver the scope, teaching how to position lesions and executing maneuvers, and then also the pre and post procedural aspects that are just as important as everything else. So we'll start with scope and equipment. So I remember back to my first day of fellowship, uh, July 1st, the fir our, our attending, the very first thing our consult attending did was took us into a room. There were no patients there. I don't even think we had patients scheduled. And he sat down and he showed us all of the equipment. And I thought it was a very powerful thing, as simple as it sounds. But they actually went through what the different buttons are, this is the light source, this is the processor, sort of how things work, and went through each button just to at least hear it once. This is how you turn it on and off. This is how you adjust the brightness. This is what white balance is, and this is how you do it. It sounds very simple, but this is, this is the basics that we need to start at. Same with understanding the anatomy of the scope. So again, when you have, a, especially with, with July coming up, we're gonna have new fellows. I think just to, as a simple reminder, just to go over these basics with them, that this is the, the um, umbilicus, this is plugs into the scope, and then this is the handle of the scope, and it's important to go over the dials, the buttons, the biopsy valve, if it's a colonoscope, that there's a stiffness control, and then that there's a shaft with a light at the end. This is probably, of all the equipment things, I think this is one of the more important things uh, to help our fellows understand because understanding the insides of the scope really helps you understand how to troubleshoot when things don't go right. Um, so, so again, and you'll have this material that you are free to use uh, in, in, in teaching, but you know, I think one of the most important things to help our fellows understand is that the suction channel, which is this green uh, line here, is in continuity with the biopsy valve. So very simple concept. When you have a biopsy forceps or a snare through your, through your uh, accessory channel, you're not gonna be able to suction anything up. It sounds simple, but these are important points uh, to, to uh, explain to the fellows. They should understand that there's uh, water and that that water is pumped through um, it's aerosolized through an air pump. It's not aerosolized, but it's pumped by pressurized air uh, through the water channel. And then by pushing down on the button, it allows water, it, can, it completes the circuit and allows water to go out the, uh, that end. And that by just holding your finger over this little valve, it's gonna redirect air that's, that's normally flowing out of this channel. By putting your finger over it, it's gonna redirect it back through this channel into the scope. And the whole reason that this is open is so we don't inadvertently insufflate our patients. 
Same thing with how this button works. You, you push the suction button in, it completes this circuit of, these, of this green channel, and it allows suction, uh, allows you to be connected to suction here. And again, just going over the, the tip and the, the different aspects, the light source, the, the lens, this is where the, the chips and the camera are housed, the air water nozzle, the biopsy channel, and then some scopes, the newer ones, have water jets, which are separate from, uh, from the air water uh, nozzle. So again, this is really important because it helps the fellow troubleshoot when things don't go well or things don't go right. So my water button isn't working. How can, they, how can we help them troubleshoot it? Well, again, it goes over teaching them the steps of how to set up a scope, how to plug it in, how to, how to do the little checklist of things we do to make sure the little clamp is open on this end so that water can actually be pumped out. Or the polyp I suctioned up is not in the trap. Again, simple concepts. Is, is there something in the suction channel, i.e. a snare? Um, is, the, is the lesion trapped up in the biopsy valve or under, under the suction valve and to know to check those things. So again, these are things that can be gone over prior to any endoscopy or during the endoscopy as they come up. The other thing that's kind of fun to do is once they think they're really good at it is to sort of sabotage things. So um, sometimes with our fellow, we'll take the EUS machine and we'll just play with some of the knobs and change some of the settings. So when they put it down and they say, I can't see anything, it's like, well, you're right, fix it. Figure out what the problem is and troubleshoot it. So there are very simple and safe ways to do that with upper endoscopy. And then lastly, the accessories. Again, very basic concept, I think, is to have the fellows handle the accessories outside of the scope um, to see how they work, to operate them on both ends. I think it's kind of neat to have the fellows be the techs for each other so that if one is doing the actual polypectomy, the other fellow is on the end opening and closing. That way they know how these things work so that they can communicate effectively to the nurse or the tech when they're doing the procedure and, and leading the intervention. So as far as tools of the trade go, I think it's important that we physically demonstrate how the scope is set up demonstrate how the accessories work, have the fellow have active hands-on, and ideally this is done in an empty room without a patient there, so there's plenty of, of time to ask questions and to, to flub it a few times. So we'll move on to maneuvering the scope. So again, just having to do this every day, um, you start to learn how people learn and what are the concepts and hills that both teacher and student have to get over. So I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but there are four stages of competence. And I think endoscopy is a perfect model for this. Uh, for this. So the first stage is unconscious incompetence. So they have no clue that they are doing something wrong. Once they get over that hurdle, they develop conscious incompetence. They start recognizing that there's deficits. Oh, I'm not supposed to put the biopsy forceps through the stomach wall? Okay, so they realize something's wrong. The next step is conscious competence. So they understand how to do it, but it requires a conscious effort and often requires breaking a maneuver down into individual steps, and I'll, and I'll show you examples of this. And then the last stage is unconscious competence, which is second nature, muscle memory, it's mastery. And with that, they're able to teach others. So I think one of the most critical parts of teaching endoscopy, and Jerry's going to talk about this as well, is sort of the relationship of body movements to how the scope reacts. Um, and this is important because it's really essential for maintaining a stable position. And as we always like to say, if you can't see the lesion, if you can't maintain it in a stable position, you're not going to be able to do your therapy safely or effectively. So understanding how your body moves, uh, body movements affect the scope is, a, is one way I think we can break down all the individual steps of doing endoscopy. So I call this the core four. So first year fellows, um, you know, when they're just getting their hands on the scope, I try to keep it very simple and describe the four maneuvers they can do with the scope. Let's see if this works. So the first one is very simple, in and out, okay? The second one is up and down, using the left thumb to maneuver the big wheel up and down. 
Left and right is accomplished by maneuvering your arm and your shoulder. And you'll see that the scope will move to the left or the right. And then lastly, very important, is torquing right and left, so rotational. So those are very simple core movements. And what I try to teach fellows early on is that they should not be doing more than one of these at any particular time. So if there's an ulcer there that they want to biopsy and it's 10 centimeters away, they should use one maneuver at a time, as painful and as long as it may take them, to get there and maintain that position. Again, just simple demonstrations, showing them what their hand, where their hands are supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. I'll never forget, I did an ASG first year fellows course a couple years ago, handed the scope to the fellow and she did this. And she just stared at it and she was holding it with both hands, have n had no idea what to do. Um, so again, very simple things. The left hand holds the scope, the thumb operates the up-down dial, the big wheel, and again, as I showed you, the arm elicits the right and left movement of the scope tip. The right hand holds the scope shaft, moves it in and out. And I think in the beginning, it's okay for them to cross over with their right hand to operate the right left dial or the little dial. Right hand torques the scope and uh, it should be used to insert and manipulate accessories. So again, maintaining a stable position. If your arm doesn't move, but your body does, the scope, what you see on the screen, is, is not going to move. So I think that's, we'll just watch it one more time at my embarrassment. But, but again, if, if, as long as the scope is not moving, everything else can be moving. But again, it's not uncommon that fellows start turning themselves into a pretzel. They're unconsciously torquing the scope this way, torquing the scope that way, and everything's flying around. So you can always redirect them to stop try to maintain that stable position and use those core four maneuvers to just sort of inch their way to the lesion. So we'll go on to positioning lesions and executing maneuvers. So here the teaching point is to emphasize that the position of the accessory channel is located at six or seven o'clock on the scope tip and that we want to get the target lesion at that position. And again, the whole point of this is that it's going to allow for optimal maneuvers, whether that's taking a simple biopsy we're doing therapy for bleeders, snaring polyps, and even suctioning up specimens and clearing fluid puddles. So that's the, that's the point to emphasize here is that the scope, the accessory channels at six to seven o'clock. Again, it depends on what system you use. Sometimes it's at five o'clock, but that's where we want our lesion because that's where our accessory is gonna come out and that's where it's gonna be able to be accessed safely and easily. As far as executing maneuvers, I try to just keep it simple. I tell them, find your target, do whatever you have to do to get it at six o'clock, and then once it's there, maintain that stable position. And again, that all depends on making sure they're not moving other parts of their body unconsciously or consciously. I like to have them lock both dials. And then I think in the beginning, it's very important that while they maintain that position, we have them manipulate the accessory with their right hand. I think it's a really bad habit and we see it all the time when there's an ulcer and the biopsy forceps is sticking out of the scope that the fellow takes the scope and rams the whole thing as one big biopsy forcep. I think that's not teaching them the fine, the fine muscle, fine tuning maneuvers that they need because when they, when they have a difficult polyp or a difficult bleeder later on, you're going to want to, they, they're going to need to have that muscle memory and that ability to do fine tuning. So again, I think it's, it's good that they get used to doing things with their right hand uh, as far as accessories. So very simple maneuvers. Again, things you can do that, that take half a minute. You can do it during an endoscopy. Um, one trick is to, and I actually learned this from Dave Greenwald when I was a first year fellow, when he was teaching at the first year fellows course. Uh, but it was using, taking a closed biopsy forceps and having the fellow trace their initials on the gastric wall without having to lift the forceps off of the mucosa. You, you think it sounds easy, but it's not. It requires multiple maneuvers. Uh, but again, one, they, they get this very quickly. And again, it starts to build that muscle memory. Correct. You don't do it with APC. You don't do it with anything like that. Um, and again, this is another way to emphasize the effect of body position on the tip of the scope. Again, emphasizing maintaining a stable position. So how do you put it all together? I, I, you know, graduated responsibility. So once they sort of get comfortable with the mechanics of the scope and those core four maneuvers, 
maybe you just start by having them biopsy the gastric body. Sounds easy, right? So have them biopsy that. Once they get comfortable with that, you can say, all right, let's target a specific fold. Let's go after that fold. So now they have to use, again, a little bit more skill. Next will be biopsying or, or doing therapy on a lesion. So biopsying specifically the edge of the ulcer and then maybe the center of an ulcer and then graduating to therapy, applying the gold probe at the visible vessel uh, in a particular ulcer. So again, the four stages of competence. Uh, they start off unconsciously incompetent. At some point, they have this aha moment where they become aware that they're doing things wrong, and they actually take a dip on that learning curve until they become conscious, and when they become consciously incompetent. Following this, this is the most, this is the steepest part of the curve. This is where change occurs. This is where learning occurs until they become consciously competent. So now they know not only what they're doing is wrong, but what they're doing is right, and they can break it down into those individual maneuvers. And then the last step is unconscious competence. It's second nature to them. They've mastered the maneuver and can now go on to teach it to others. Lastly, I'll just end on sort of understanding yourself as a teacher. Uh, and recognizing your own weaknesses. Um, I came across this, I thought this was pretty interesting. It's the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is a cognitive bias where an unskilled individuals mistakenly assess their ability to be much higher than accurate. And these were two, Dunning and Kruger were two Cornell psychologists who came up with this theory when uh, they know there was a story in the paper about this bank robber who took lemon juice, knowing that it is part of invisible ink and he rubbed the lemon juice all over his face and went and robbed a bank, thinking that no one would be able to recognize his facial features. Obviously, it didn't work. So I think not only for the, the trainees, but also for our, ourselves, I think we have to understand what our own lack of skill is. Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of interesting. Incompetent people will fail to recognize their own lack of skill. They'll fail to recognize genuine skill in others or the extremity of their own inadequacy. Uh, and they'll fail to recognize or acknowledge their previous lack of skill if they were exposed to training for that skill before. So again, I think it's kind of neat to talk about learning theory to understand how we teach, we think, and our trainees teach and think. So how do we assess competency in endoscopy? So this is in the packet. This is the uh, ASGE ACE uh, tool, Assessment of Competency in Endoscopy. This takes 10 seconds to fill out. Um, it's eight questions. And you can see it goes over a very, very standardized, very simple scoring sheet, assessing the fellow's knowledge of the procedure, the man, you know, did they recognize and manage discomfort? So specifically, what is the furthest landmark without any hands-on assistance? What was their ability to do scope tip control, advancement techniques? Can they adequately visualize mucosa, et cetera? So you can, you can read this. And then at the end, there's an overall assessment regarding their overall hands-on skills and overall cognitive skills as part of the endoscopy. The last few slides, uh, just things outside of scoping. What else can we demonstrate to them? And Bridget sort of touched on this. So we have to make sure they understand the indication for the procedure. I think it's very important that they witness us doing an informed consent so that we, they know all of the critical components of that. We can discuss patient positioning. And then preparation. You know, if you're doing a bleeder case, let's have all the equipment ready to go. Let's have it all out. Let's anticipate so that we're not wasting time during the procedure getting everything set up, trying to be efficient, and of course being familiar with the anticipated accessories. Post-procedure. Documentation. This is, this is major in, in many ways, obviously medical legally, but also just being accurate and being able to effectively communicate your findings to the referring doctor or to your colleagues. Um, and we can spend a whole hour talking about that. I think it's interesting to demonstrate to our fellows how to discuss results with patients, how to break bad news, cancer diagnoses, complication diagnoses, um, and then also formulating a follow-up plan. Lastly, communication. They're going to model our behavior with how we communicate with the nurses, the techs, and anesthesia. So again, that's another important uh, aspect. So beyond the scope, I think our trainees will model their behavior based on that of their teacher. I still remember things I saw my, my teachers do during fellowship. Some, some of them are sitting in the front row. Um, demonstration of non-technical aspects of endoscopy will have long-lasting effects. So just to summarize the key points, 
very simple review equipment and do a hands-on review talk about those four core body movements and maintaining stable position I want to emphasize getting the target lesion to six o'clock I like to emphasize using the right hand for accessories and then also modeling patient staff interaction and communication so thank you my task is to talk to you about uh, how we go about teaching colonoscopy to, uh, to GI fellows. Actually, I think that uh, there's a big difference between what you teach and how you teach. The, um, the what you teach is um, relatively easy. The how you teach uh, may be a more difficult subject and I think that we have to tell the fellows when they are beginning off that colonoscopy is a completely different mindset than endoscopy. In endoscopy you push the scope in the esophagus, you push in the stomach, you push in the duodenum and when you're all finished you pull back. Um, colonoscopy is completely different and I think that we have to tell the fellows that the techniques for the two are vastly different. Sure, holding the scope is the same, putting accessories in is the same, but the way you do it is different. And in endoscopy, you don't have to be concerned about a three-dimensional model. Uh, when you do the stomach, it's really fairly straightforward. You can see everywhere you want to go, and it's right ahead of you. In colonoscopy, it's really in three dimensions, and this is something that we have to impart to the uh, to the fellows but as uh, Chris said the options for colonoscopy are limited this is all you can do whether you're Jerry Way or whether you're a first-year fellow this is all they can do there's nothing else you can do and how does one whiz through the colon in six or seven minutes versus an hour for the beginning fellow is something that uh, that's our obligation to impart to them. Well, I think it's a whole bunch of teaching points. One of the first, one of the first teaching points uh, that uh, we have to get across is that the anatomy is very peculiar. The anatomy is different from patient to patient, but certainly is different from anything they've encountered. This is Gray's anatomy. This is the original picture of what the colon looks like. Now, when you look at the uh, at the colon. You see the rectum, pelvic colon, um, in the abdomen, and then the descending colon. Well, there is now something called scope guide. We used to use fluoroscopy when I first started doing colonoscopy. It was thought you couldn't do colonoscopy without fluoroscopy. Uh, then uh, we, we uh, noted there's very certain landmarks you can use, and we got away from fluoroscopy. But now uh, the, there's magnetic uh, transducers inside uh, every adult Olympus colonoscope. In fact, they've just started putting them this this during th this DDW. Uh, they've started putting the uh, magnetic transducers in pediatric colonoscopes as well. So, with the special equipment that you can have outside the patient, uh, you use those electromagnets to constitute a picture of what the scope looks like. And this is what the scope looks like uh, under under a scope guide. So the black is posterior with the patient lying supine, and the gray is anterior. So the gray is towards you, and so this is what the colon looks like. It looks sort of like this, but if you uh, look uh, carefully, this is the rectum. It follows the hollow of the sacrum, so it's posterior. Posterior until it comes up out of the pelvis, then it's very anterior. So it's important that the, pe that the fellows understand that the anatomy is such that there are areas where the colon is very accessible to the fellow. And we have to use that as a teaching aid for colonoscopy. Then the descending colon is posterior. We can't do very much with the descending colon. So what about the radiographic anatomic co correlation? We don't look at barium enemas anymore. In fact, it's unusual. It used to be the patient would come with their barium enema, and we'd put them up on the view box, take a look at it, and say, here's a lesion. Now, patients never bring a barium enema. They'll bring a little disc 
that you can't read on your computer. But that's, that's what they bring. And, but if you look at a barium enema, uh, it also mirrors the anatomy uh, that we are looking at, um, at the old Gray's anatomy. Here is the anterior part. Here is the rectum, comes up to anterior here. Then uh, down here, that begins to go posterior. This becomes posterior. And then the descending colon here is a posterior structure. So these are all important points to let the fellows know that there are a couple places where the colon becomes very anterior. One is here in the pelvic colon. The other is here in the transverse colon. And the third is here in the cecum. That's why a long time ago, people used to think they were in the cecum by seeing light in the right lower quadrant, and that was one of the criterias for, uh, for being there. But now we insist that they see the ileocecal valve, they see the appendix yellow orifice, and hopefully get into the uh, terminal ileum. All right, so uh, we want to go from this to this. That is our job, is to teach the fellow how to go from a very tortuous colon to a straightaway colon that's not going to give the patient uh, any discomfort and distress and here and biopsy or take out a lesion in the cecum. Well, that takes a little while. But the fact is that uh, we have to tell, talk about not only anatomy, talk about air. Uh, you hear lots of stories about air. As far as I'm concerned, give as much air as you want. But I hear other people say, give minimal air going through the colon. And I think it doesn't make any difference. Uh, you put the air in and it goes in the colon and the colon gets distended anyway. I've recently read an article in Digestive Endoscopy using water endoscopy and I have to tell you that I think it's the way to go. We can talk about that later. But uh, I think uh, uh, Chris talked to you about torque. I think the right hand does most of the work not only in upper endoscopy, but also in colonoscopy. It uh, allows you to push and pull and do torque. And for torque, we change directions. But we have to tell the fellow that if you torque a scope like this, it doesn't do very much. But if you turn the, the dial and torque the scope, then it does a lot. So you can go around a corner by using torque and dial controls at the same time. So you use your dial control going up and you torque to the right and you get around the corner. I think that um, we use torque to remove loops in the colon to straighten uh, the, uh, the scope and uh, turn the corners. But I think that uh, Chris is absolutely right. Thumb on the big dial all the time, small dial with the right hand, but uh, gravity. I had a, um, uh, a guy come up to me at one of the, uh, the courses I was doing, and he said afterward, uh, Dr. Way, I'm a self-taught surgeon. Um, and I do colonoscopy, but tell me, why doesn't gravity work in the colon? I said, uh, what do you mean? He said, well, sometimes I see fluid. It's on the top. Why doesn't it fall down? So I said um, to the self-taught surgeon, um, I take the scope and I rotate it around until it's the bottom and I leave it there. So he said, oh, thanks, Dr. Way. I mean, what am I going to tell this guy? Now, sedation. I think it's incumbent upon us as teachers to teach the full range of sedation. Here at Mount Sinai Hospital, you can't do a procedure without an anesthesiologist. I think that's bullshit. You can't tell the fellows to go out into the world and only use propofol. That the, the statistics are that there's only about 30% of physicians in the United States use propofol. 70% use conscious sedation. And I think it's very important to teach the fellows how to do conscious sedation. So when I do my teaching on Wednesday morning, I insist the fellows use conscious sedation, and I'm the only guy who uses, who teaches the fellows how to use conscious sedation. They have to learn before they finish because not everybody in the world uses propofol. In fact, when our chief came down from Boston, he never used propofol. So it was, the, the thing, thing is that in New York, um, we have a different view on the world than uh, everybody else. Maybe that's good, maybe it's bad. Okay, then we have to teach the important colonoscopy points. 
scope handling, torque steering, how to keep the scope straight, that it will always tend to make a loop. But every event creates a loop, and we have to talk about abdominal pressure and how to keep it straight. But loops are a part of colonoscopy, and I think the fellows have to realize that every time they put the scope in, they're going to make a loop because the anatomy is such that loops happen. The scope guide will show you that not all loops are the same configuration. In the sigmoid colon, you can make a sigmoid loop, an alpha loop, reverse alpha, reverse spiral. A long time ago, we used to talk about alpha loops. I haven't heard that term in a long time, except when I go to some places, the instructors say to the fellows, all right, now make an alpha loop. And I say, what is he, crazy? But that's, uh, it's, in the, it's in, ingrained in some people's uh, colonoscopic memory, and I think that loops happen, uh, but empirically, we can take these loops out without needing a scope guide, without needing fluoroscopy. It's just learning how to do it. What about pulling back to decrease the loop? Well, we have to tell the fellows that you can pull back. If you keep pushing, instead of going forward, you can just make that bent cane effect right up to the diaphragm. Then if you keep pushing, you make a huge big loop, and the scope will start to go forward. That's what usually happens with propofol. I see people push, 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 and they never pull back. And what happens when they push? This is what happens when they push. They push it way up into the diaphragm, and then it starts to go forward because there's no place else for it to go. So um, under propofol, patients don't mind, but under conscious sedation, they'll let you know that that's probably not the way to go. Um, so you have to pull back the shaft and straighten it every time you push it in. You have to pull back. But these are things we have to tell the, the, our fellows to keep the scope straight. So keeping the scope straight makes progress easier. It eliminates patient discomfort. It uh, gives you the ability to use less medication and probably eliminates the risk of perforation. So the most important maneuver during colonoscopy is keep the scope straight. And the way to do that is to pull back the scope. I think uh, it's not so difficult, but the fellows have to learn that they have to pull back the scope to keep the scope straight. I mean, it's something that we have to tell them. It's not inbred in the fellow. The f in fact, the fellows hate to pull the scope back from 60 centimeters to 30 centimeters in order for them to go further forward. But in order, once you have that big loop of the scope, sometimes it's very difficult to keep pushing and go forward. So it's very important, it's counterintuitive that if you want to go further forward, you have to pull the scope back to straighten it before you, uh, you go. Well, the thing is that uh, why do we pull back with clockwise torque? We pull back with clockwise torque because this loop is a clockwise loop. If we pull back, and here's a cartoon of it, if you pull back with a clockwise torque, it locks that loop in and doesn't allow the tip to come back. If you pull the back with counterclockwise torque, it would go out, it would come back uh, instead in the same way you put it in. So clockwise torque is important, but it's, it's a concept that we have to imbue in our fellows in teaching colonoscopy. Okay, what about uh, the pain? Well, pain is uh, a, a frequent accompaniment of colonoscopy, and the pain comes from stretching the mesentery. When you take the mesentery and you stretch it up like this, you, you, you have a lot of pain. People that are, are heavy and fat have big mesenteries, and their mesentery is already stretched, and the, in, in addition, the older the patients, the more lax is the mesentery. So I like fat, old patients are terrific because the mesentery is stretched. Uh, they, uh, you can do anything you want, and uh, they don't complain of pain. But uh, young people, uh, in fact, young women, are exquisitely sensitive to, uh, to making a loop in the, uh, in the sigmoid colon, and uh, one has to be very careful that you don't uh, re overstretch the mesentery. So the right, the right hand does all the work, uh, pulls back, straightens, and uh, keep the scope relatively straight. I think the second most important maneuver is, is, uh, is uh, abdominal pressure. Now, people have no idea about abdominal pressure. In fact, the f when the fellows say to the nurse, give me abdominal pressure, I always hit him in the arm. 
not the nurse. I hit the fellow in the arm because the fellow should tell the nurse or the assistant where they want abdominal pressure because there's so many places in the, in the abdomen to give abdominal pressure. I had a nurse come to me once from one of the instrument manufacturers. She had a sheet like this with 32 pictures on it of abdominal pressure. And she gives talks to nurses on how to give abdominal pressure doing 32 different maneuvers. I said, holy smokes, that's impossible to learn. Oh, they can learn it. <laughs> so, but I think abdominal pressure is very important. It does tend to keep the scope straight. It may uh, uh, move the tip forward. And I think one of the things that the fellows never learn, and when I tell the fellows that you should have a 15-second limit on abdominal pressure, either you give abdominal pressure to do a maneuver, and it works, or it doesn't work. But if it doesn't work, tell the nurse to relax. But I see, and the nurses always say, oh, Dr. Way, you've got to tell everybody that because of the attendings keep the nurses pushing for the entire case. And let me give you a clue. After the first minute, they look like they're pushing, but they're not pushing anymore. <laughs> so superpubic pressure is the first place to give abdominal pressure. That is because it's the first place where the colon rises up out of the pelvis, goes very anterior. So instead of doing this bent cane effect up the diaphragm, if the assistant gives superpubic pressure, the scope will hit against the hand and start to go forward without making a big loop. So I think it's concepts like this that we have to get across to the fellows. And we have to understand it first before the fellows uh, learn it. So here's the pressure. Here's what it looks like on x-ray. This is very anterior. This is posterior. Superpubic pressure does help. Then the third most important maneuver is aspirating air because aspirating air can, can uh, markedly help to advance the scope. Um, if you look at this, here's a, here's a balloon, one of those long balloons. It's 11 inches long. But look, when we blow it up, it's 40 inches long. Well, by the same token, if we take air out, the colon really becomes much shorter and not only shorter, it not only decreases circumference, but it decreases length. So it will markedly help with colonoscopy. Here again is a glove and a, and, a measuring, uh, and a measuring stick here. You see how long it is? But when it's deflated, it's really not so long. So it, uh, it certainly is one of the important adjuncts to colonoscopy is removing air. So the bare bones of colonoscopy keep the scope straight, abdominal pressure, aspirate air. Well, that's what we should be teaching um, how to do colonoscopy, but I mean what to do, but how to teach is different. Where should the instructor stand during the case? Well, the instructor should probably stand right back here because the instructor can then watch the monitor across the room, the monitor in back of the, end, uh, the, the, the fellow, watch the fellow's hands and watch what's happening with the scope here. So there's a place, I see instructors the patient is over here, the instructor is over here, look at the screen. I mean, give me a break. You got to watch what's happening and that's what you're there for. You got to see what's going on on the table in the, uh, with the patient. But I think the teacher, uh, supervisor, you have to know the history and have the, the GI fellow present the history to you beforehand. Review the goals that they're going to do. The, remember that pulling back may be better than pushing with the colonoscope. Speed is not the goal. In fact, the, uh, the head of anesthesia comes into my room all the time when I'm teaching, and he bugs me that I'm taking too long. But I spend a lot of time teaching the, the, the fellows because it's important they learn, learn the concepts. So speed is my goal when I'm teaching colonoscopy. Um, remember, the patient is the most important person in the room, so they have to maintain the comfort for the patient all the time and look out for the patient. And uh, you, we have to tell them the various options that are possible. But the student, my feeling is, at first, the first year fellow should observe several examinations. If possible, practice on a simulator. So what I usually do is have a senior person do the examination while, and, and then have the student withdraw. Because you can't do very much wrong when you withdraw, but you have to watch like a hawk 
because if they come back too fast and miss something, uh, it's your responsibility. Remember, it's our responsibility as teachers that we're the ones that have to conduct the examination. We're the ones who have to be sure that that examination is a good examination. So I think uh, uh, eventually you let the, scope, the student handle the scope and uh, you have to tell them continuously. I keep a continuous verbal dialogue, a monologue, with the, uh, with the uh, student, uh, what they should do, pull back, uh, the highlights tell you you should go a little bit to the left, it's always behind that corner, and, and they will, they often tell me that once they finish their fellowship, they hear me on their shoulder when they're doing procedures long after they've uh, finished their training. So I think every case needs to be monitored close by the instructor. As an educator, you have to provide a total overview of the, ca of the case. As a mentor, you should bond with every student during the session. You should bond with them and give them the encouragement they need. You have to direct the student through the passage. An instructor, you have to tell them what to do. As a teacher, you have to tell them what's right and what's wrong. You have to tell them right then and there, no, you did the wrong thing, or what the hell are you doing? As a cheerleader, you have to give constant encouragement to them because sometimes they're there sweating away and you have to give them the encouragement that they can do it and you'll talk them through it. As a coach, feedback continually during the procedure. As a synthesizer, put it all together after the examination. Tell them how it went. Tell them they were terrific, but they should have done such and such. Okay, so I think that's the way we should, uh, we should be very enthusiastic about teaching. Here's the two um, uh, evaluation tools for, for you to look at. The Mayo Colonoscopy Skills Assessment Tool came out in 2010. Uh, ASG's Assessment of Competency came out in 2014. Uh, this was written by uh, Bob Sedlak, and uh, if you look at them, they're going to be very similar because Bob Sedlak was also on this committee that <laughs> wrote the other guidelines. So he wrote the first guidelines, and he was instrumental in the second guidelines. So here's what they look like, uh, very similar. This is colonoscopy assessment, very similar to the one that, uh, that Chris showed you. This is the male colonoscopy skills assessment. Look at what it says, pre-procedure, procedural skills, labels 1, 2, 3, 4. Here's the other one, <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4. They look exactly the same. There are minor changes, but uh, if you want to, the, I think the ASG one is, is a little bit um, uh, more recent than the one in 2010. And... Um, I offer that to you for uh, ability to, uh, to monitor uh, the progress of the fellows. So I think in summary, you have to talk about endoscopic anatomy, safety indications, risks, and scope maneuvers. You have to tailor your, your involvement to the improving skill level of the trainee. And as an instructor, as an educator, cheerleader, guide, you're going to be all those sort of things. Response, you're responsible for both training and the procedure itself. It's better if there's someone who's a great endoscopist in the room, but the best is someone passionate about teaching. Thank you.